Our scripture this morning is Luke chapter 18, verses 6 through 8. Luke chapter 18, verses 6 through 8. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Thank you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you today. And I just pray that you would speak through me now, that this word that is shared this morning would be from you and that it would bless each one of us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The title for my sermon today is, Will Jesus Find Faith? Turn to Luke chapter 18. This is a parable that Jesus gives, and we pick it up in verse 1. It says, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. The parable that Jesus gives here is an illustration of how Jesus believes that we should pray. This is one of the ways that he teaches us that we as his believers should approach God when we pray. Too many of us give up too quickly in our prayers. We come to the Lord with requests that are according to his will, and when we don't see an answer as quickly as we would like, oftentimes we give up and say, well, I guess the Lord's just not going to hear this prayer. And so the Lord has a parable for us to consider when we think about how we approach the Lord in prayer every day. This is the parable in verse 2. There was in a city a judge which feared not God nor regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. You know, from time to time here on this earth, you may, I may be called to stand before a judge who makes decisions according to the laws of the land, and we hope and have confidence that the judge that is appointed to hear our case would be a just and fair judge. But in this parable, that is not the case. This is a judge who did not fear or respect God, and he didn't care about man. So if you put some pieces together, you could gather that this is a judge who probably gained his position through bribery. And in his position, the decisions that he would make would be based upon who could pay him the most money. It was a position in which he was enriching himself for the good of himself for the, at the expense of the public. It kind of sounds like politicians. But that's not the point. But this was an unjust judge. The problem for this widow is that this judge was her only option to give her justice. She didn't have any other options to get what she needed. And a widow in any society throughout the history of earth is in a hard spot. Especially in Bible times, especially in the times of Jesus, a woman would be in a difficult spot. A woman relied upon her husband for income, and if her husband died, she would be especially disadvantaged. And not only is she disadvantaged from the loss of her husband, she's been wronged by someone else on this earth, 
so much so that she is now coming before the judge. This, the word for adversary is the Greek word antidikos, which means opponent and law. So someone has essentially violated the law of the land and put her at disadvantage. So if we had a righteous judge, things should be set in order pretty quickly, but this widow doesn't have a righteous judge to speak to. Now remember, this is a parable that Jesus is giving, telling us about how we should pray and how we shouldn't faint or how we should not give up when we come to the Lord in prayer. Notice what happens in this story. So the widow comes. She says, avenge me of mine adversary. This word avenge in the Greek in verses 3 and 5 is the Greek word ektikio, which is the same word as seen in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, where you have souls crying under the altar saying, how long, O Lord, till you judge and avenge our blood? This word means to do one justice, to avenge a thing, to exact revenge, or to vindicate one's right. And here we have Jesus describing a common earthly scenario in which a woman has an adversary and she pleads incessantly until an unjust judge gives her what she wants. Now notice the thinking of this judge in verse 4. It says, and he, the judge, would not avenge her for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So, what's this judge saying? Is he saying, you know what? My bad. What was I thinking? This poor woman. She was so wronged by this person who wronged her. Look at this horrible scenario. What was I thinking? How could I have no heart? She's been deeply wronged. The poor woman, she lost her husband and now this person has wronged her. What was I thinking? I need to just set things right and give her what she needs. That's the only the fair thing to do. Is that what the judge is saying here? Absolutely not. He doesn't care. He's like, I'm sick of this woman. And you know what? I'm not going to get a penny out of her. But there's something better sometimes than money, and that's to have annoying people go away. <laughs> so I'm going to have her go away. Here, woman, you can have exactly what you want. I'll never have to see you again a day in my life. Jesus is making a point here. Now we come to verse 6, and the Lord says, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? So now, interestingly, the word avenge here, it's, it's similar. It's the Greek word ektakesis as opposed to ektakeo. And it's similar, but it means a, a carrying out of, or giving acquittal, carrying a sense of vindication, a meeting out of justice, performing justice. And... That's what this unjust judge does. But notice what Jesus says, Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with him? And so if you're not necessarily paying attention, you might think, okay, well, this widow came to an unjust judge, and she became so annoying to him by coming to him day after day after day. It wasn't one day or two days or three days or 10 days or 20 or 30. It could have been six months or a year or two years. We don't know how long. But it took long enough that eventually the judge said, here, you can have what you want. Get out of here. And we might tend to think, you know what, maybe I just need to make myself annoying to God so that he'll make me go away. Is that what God is saying here? Are we coming to an unjust judge who doesn't care about our plight? Absolutely not. This is what Jesus is saying. This widow knew that the deck was stacked against her. She knew that the judge didn't care about her. 
She knew that she had no way to bribe him to get what she needed, but he was the only option she had to get the help that she needed, and so she came time and time and time again because she believed that eventually that her persistence would pay off. And he asked the question, shall not God avenge his own elect? Though he bear along with them, the elect are those who cry day and night. And notice what he says in verse 8. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. So this widow is coming to the unjust judge time and time and time and time again, and she's not getting what she wants, but she doesn't give up. And the Lord says, shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night in him? He says, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Now you might be asking in your mind, well then what about my prayers? Notice the next word. Nevertheless, So whatever comes next takes greater precedence over what was said before. When we look at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. What does Jesus say here when he says nevertheless? Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. In other words, faith is connected to how we pray to the Lord. And some of us pray to the Lord like, Lord, please, please help me. This is tough. Give me what I need. Help me. And then it doesn't come like I knew he wouldn't hear. And God is saying this widow had more faith in an unjust judge then many of my people have in my ability to answer your prayers. She was more persistent in approaching an unjust judge than we are in coming to the throne of grace. Will the Son of Man find faith when he comes on the earth? Where are those that have faith when he comes, when Jesus comes to this earth? Is he going to find a people who have faith? Where are the elect who are crying day and night unto him? You know, Matthew 24, verse 24 says, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That means if we aren't crying day and night unto the Lord, we will be deceived. Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Where are those who are watching and praying with faith? Now, this kind of prayer life that we're talking about here, sometimes we get confused about answers to prayer. You know, What the Lord is talking about here isn't referring to, I need a new car, Lord, so please, by next week I need it. I'd like a nice new house. I'd like a spouse that fits my specifications. I'd like a job that would pay me this amount of money. Now, those are all nice things that can be in accordance with God's will for his glory that he can give us in due time. But, you know, the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And yet we're all often praying for these other things first and neglecting to seek the kingdom of God first. And we wonder why we don't have the spiritual blessings. And it might just be, and in fact, it's probably not just a might be thing. It's probably because we're not crying day and night unto the Lord for God's kingdom of righteousness to be formed within our lives. You know, there are certain things that when we pray according to the will of God, God guarantees that he will give to us. For example the forgiveness of sins, to be justified by faith. And to have faith, I mean, to be justified requires faith because we're wicked and sinful. 
And to accept by faith the promises of God that he can truly justify us does take faith. And when we doubt the promises of God, like, well, I'm not sure God could really forgive me. I'm not really sure that God could justify me. That is not faith. And God is looking for people who will cry day and night until those storm clouds of doubt are removed from our mind. And by faith, we accept the promises of God as we pray them back to him saying, Lord, avenge me of mine adversary, the devil, who would cause me to doubt what your word says about how you can change my life. God wants to give us forgiveness of sins. God wants us to give us overcoming power. God wants to give us deliverance from that spirit of bitterness, from that unforgiving spirit where the person who wronged us so many years ago, or maybe just last week, we just have such a hard time forgiving. You know what? When we cry day and night unto the Lord, he will give us that which he has promised. He will allow us by his grace to forgive the person who has wronged us, to claim by faith that we are forgiven of our sins, to claim by faith that we are now empowered to live an overcoming life by faith. But where are the people in the church who are crying day and night for such deliverance? We go back to this word adversary, as I mentioned earlier. It's from the Greek word antidikos, which means opponent in law. So the widow had an opponent with respect to the law of the land. Well, we have an adversary too, known as the devil, who is opposed to the law of God. We understand from Romans 7 that the law is holy, just, and good. We know that God is holy, just, and good. And yet the devil is our adversary like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, seeking whom he can within God's church especially to go against God's law. The devil is against God and his law. And yet 1 Peter 5 verse 9 says we are to resist steadfast in the faith. In order to resist him, we need to be crying day and night unto the Lord. Now, we often give too much credit to the devil for the power that he has. Yes, he has power. But you know, he's no match for God when we're praying to the Lord. We talk so much about the devil does this and the devil does that. But how, much, how about talking about the power of God? The devil is going around seeking whom he may devour. Yes, he is devouring the world, but he doesn't have to try that hard within the world. His focus is squarely on God's people, especially Seventh-day Adventists, because we are God's end-time people who keep the commandments of God. As I mentioned in my message here last night, Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was wroth with a woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so that word war in Revelation 12, 17 is from the word polemos, which means it's a war of words. And so the devil uses argumentation and philosophy philosophical reasoning to try to undermine the law of God. And we see this happening. There's so many different avenues in which the devil can attack. And in, you know, kind of in the more theoretical realm, which still has real life application, we understand that the devil is going to bring things into the church. We have heard of the Omega of apostasy, where books of a new order will be written in which the pillars of our faith will be undermined. We understand that new theology has come into the faith that undermines true righteousness by faith. We understand different philosophies have come in to the church in different avenues that paves the way for perdition for many. And, and it gets even closer than that. This attack of the devil comes into our families where strife develops within the home, where divorce comes, where there's strife between parents and children. There's also attacks in the church family where hostility and distrust develop, factions develop in the church. Boy, you know, it's, it's amazing to me some of the, the divisions that have arisen within the last two or three years over things you never would have thought would have divided God's people. And even at a closer level, the devil attacks us individually. He attacks us with how we use our time. Time that we could be using for the advancement of the cause of God, we end up wasting on entertainment and sitting around, laying around, when we could be doing more productive things. And 
there's all sorts of different ways that the devil attacks us. And the question is, where are the elect that are crying unto God day and night saying, Lord, deliver me from the attacks of Satan in my life. Deliver me from wasting time in my life. Deliver me from fighting in my family. Deliver me from being a nuisance in the church that keeps creating fights over nothing. Deliver me from accepting philosophies that would cause me to go against the word of truth. If we would cry unto the Lord day and night, the Lord would hear those prayers. He's not so much, yes, he'll give us all these other things too, the car that you need and the job that you need, but he's especially looking for people who are praying in accordance with his will, according to his word. Where are the elect who are praying until God answers prayers that are clearly in accordance to his will, where we can come forth from seasons of prayer saying, I know that the Lord is with me and he's given me peace that I'm going to walk according to his will today. If Jesus were to come right now, would this be true of you, that you are one of the elect crying day and night unto the Lord until the Lord avenges you speedily according to the power of his word? Are you incessantly by faith expecting God to avenge the honor of his name, or do you just sit idly by as things get worse in the world and in the church thinking, oh, well, those people are going to burn someday and it will be nice when Jesus comes back? We should be like the souls under the altar in Revelation 6.10 saying, How long, O Lord, till you judge and avenge? You know, it's interesting when you look at the heroes of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, the very first hero of faith is also the very, very first human being who died. That's Abel. And the very second hero of faith is Enoch, who was translated without seeing death. He's the first human being who never tasted death. And then we have Noah, who built an ark to remain on this earth. There was then Abraham, who was called to leave the, the place he was in, where his family was, to go to a place that he didn't know. Noah leaves, or excuse me, Noah stays on this earth. He remains and he builds an ark. Abraham leaves the, a familiar place. You know, then you see this phrase, they were sawn asunder. That's Isaiah. He was sawed in half. You see, stop the mouths of lions. And one story, we could apply that to Samson. And in another, we could apply it to Daniel. Isaiah, the prophet, was sawn asunder. Yet Daniel, through his faith, stopped the mouths of lions. Yet they all had faith. They had different outcomes on this earth, but not in eternity. You know, sometimes we misunderstand what faith will bring us to. You know, I, I just want to say on a personal note that I appreciate all of you in this church who have prayed for me since my accident 14 months ago. And most of you know that I had a, a, a really bad accident, fell down 15 steps, crushed the humerus, severed the radial nerve, and I've had paralysis of my wrist extension where I can't extend my wrist and my dominant hand for the last 14 months. And unfortunately, um, based on recent tests, it doesn't look like it's going to get better unless God works a miracle. It's obviously disappointing. Well, I was in Norway recently, and there was a well-meaning saint, a lady there, who um, told me that if I had just had more faith, I would have gotten better. Um, and I don't harbor any ill will towards her, but I, I reminded her that in 2 Corinthians 12, that Paul came to the Lord three times, asking that the thorn in the flesh that he had, which we believe was the loss of vision, which he experienced after Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And Paul always had that thorn in his flesh the rest of his life. And, you know, the interesting thing is, so Paul comes three times to the Lord, Lord, heal me of this thorn, and three times the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for ye. Paul is the same person who, through the grace of God, raised Eutychus from the dead. Paul also healed other people who were sick. And despite the fact that God could use Paul to heal others, God did not see fit to heal Paul of his physical malady. Sometimes it takes more faith to not be healed and to still trust in God and to be faithful to him and to choose to trust in him even if physical healing doesn't come. 
So what we're talking about here doesn't mean like, oh, if you would just pray harder, according to Luke 18, your wrist would just start working again or whatever else you might be struggling with from a physical standpoint. It does not necessarily mean that that will change. But what can happen is that God, I'll just speak of myself, God can give me trust and faith, even if my hand never gets better, I can still trust in the Lord and give a testimony of his goodness. Because I'm praying to the Lord incessantly day and night, avenge me of mine adversary. Don't let the devil plant seeds of doubt in my mind that would question the goodness of God. Help me to continue to be a testimony of faith of the goodness of God that no matter what happens on this earth, I will testify of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Those are the kind of prayers that God is going to answer, guaranteed. But he, you know, obviously my human desire would be to be healed. Worse. I'm not hoping like, oh, I hope this doesn't get better because then I can't be a good testimony. No, you kidding? I hope it gets better. But that doesn't always work that way. But will Jesus really find this kind of faith when he returns? You know, Romans 14, 23 says, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know, being the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, that's like that widow who came to the unjust judge, but we're not coming to an unjust judge. We believe that he is. We believe that he is the God of the universe. We believe that he is the God who speaks and he creates, who calleth those things which be not as though they were. We believe in the God who cares about us personally, who sent Jesus to die for us. We believe in the God who can do anything. And we believe in a God who is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. And the reward that we are seeking is not earthly riches, earthly power, fame, prosperity, and perfect health all the time, although all of those things would be nice. What we are seeking for is the reward of being in communion with God and of eternal life. And God is guaranteeing that he will answer that kind of prayer of faith speedily. But where are the people who are diligently seeking him? So many in the church say things today like, I'm so glad Jesus lived a righteous life so that I don't have to. We are drowning in Laodicean self-righteousness that is devoid of true faith. There are others that are like, I'm so glad that I'm an end time Seventh day Adventist. I know that I can be a grumpy grouch and I have my share of bad days. In fact, I have so many bad days, I have about as many bad days as good days. But you know what? I'm so glad that Jesus will overlook all of that because I'm I'm a believer in the end time truth. We don't say that explicitly, usually, but we can think that in our heart. Where are the messages in the church calling us to prepare to stand in the great day of God without a mediator? Are we just being patted on the back that our mediocre, half-hearted Christian experience will pass for being okay when Jesus comes? Now listen to the statement from Great Controversy 489. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. If those who hide and excuse their faults could see how Satan exults over them, how he taunts Christ and holy angels with their course, they would make haste to confess their sins and to put them away. Through defects in the character, Satan works to gain control of the whole mind, and he knows that if these defects are cherished, he will succeed. <clears throat> therefore, now listen to this, therefore, he is constantly seeking to deceive the followers of Christ with his fatal sophistry that it is impossible for them to overcome. Now notice, this argument, <clears throat> excuse me, this fatal sophistry is targeted to the followers of God. Now the people out in the world, they're, they're not even in the conversation about this. This target that Satan uses with this sophistry is for God's people. 
And you may have heard this sophistry in the church, and people don't necessarily realize where this is coming from. But what, what this line of reasoning goes like is this. is like, well, I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, nobody's perfect, and this is the way we're going to be until Jesus comes. And yet that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we can be overcomers by the grace of Jesus. And so the quote goes on to say, but Jesus pleads in their behalf as wounded hands, his bruised body, and he declares to all who would follow him, my grace is sufficient for ye. The quote finishes by saying, let none then regard their defects as incurable. God will give faith and grace to overcome them. You know what? There is no sin in your life that is so powerful that God can't give you the victory to overcome it. God is all-powerful. You know, we could give you testimonies of people who've overcome smoking and alcohol and other addictions, and there's other things that we can overcome too besides smoking and alcohol. Bad attitude. Being unforgiving. Gossiping tongue. Losing your temper any other number of things. And in the place of that, we receive the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. You know, God is looking for people who are crying day unto them and night unto the Lord, saying, Lord, please deliver me from this evil temper. Please deliver me from this bad attitude. Please deliver me from being unforgiving, from being bitter, from being proud of thinking that I'm better than everyone else. Deliver me of mine adversary, the devil, who is causing me or tempting me to go down this path. Lord, I claim the promise that you can deliver me from these sins in my life. And God will hear that prayer. When the Son of Man comes... Will he find faith? When he avenges his elect of our adversary, he is vindicating his name, saying, look at what I have done in my people. Revelation 12, 11 reminds us that God's people, they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. And 1 John 5, verse 4 reminds us, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. He is acquitting, Christ is acquitting his elect of our sins because through the grace of Jesus, we have overcome the devil through the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. You know, Jesus says to the Laodicean church, to him that, this is Revelation 3.21. This is to the people who think they're rich and increased with goods and don't need anything. Jesus says to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and I'm set down with my father in his throne. Let me tell you something right now. If you don't believe that you can overcome by faith through the power of God, the way Jesus overcame here on this earth, you're Laodicean. And you need the Laodicean message. That's why Jesus is saying, I stand at the door and knock, let me come in. Where's the people of faith? We haven't let Jesus come in and we... Th we are devoid of true righteousness, thinking that a belief in Jesus without the power of his life will be okay. And yet Jesus, when he was here on this earth, when he was on the cross, we're told in Desire of Ages, he could not see through the portals of the tomb. But by faith, he rested in the promises that the Father had given to him before that time. This is what we call the faith of Jesus. His death was a vindication of the character of God because he remained faithful and held on to his faith even when his senses did not show him deliverance. His faith is to be ours. Now, here's the amazing thing. When Jesus comes back, he, when, when he comes back, he's not going to see among his faithful a group of people who are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That is not what Jesus is going to see. Because, you know, to be poor means that you don't have faith. To be rich is to have faith. And when Jesus comes back, 
Revelation 14, verse 12, shows us what he sees. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God is going to see a people who are like him, who have the faith of Jesus. Now, we come back to Luke 18, and we end this story, and we're like, amen, what a powerful parable. We need to be crying unto the Lord day and night, avenge me of mine adversary. If the widow could cry to the unjust judge, I can cry to the Lord who is not unjust. He is just, and he loves me, and he's more willing to give good gifts to me than my evil earthly parents were to give gifts to me when I was a child. I can come to the Lord and receive the faith that I need, and the forgiveness that I need, and the overcoming power that I need. This is what I need, and so some Sometimes we have such an experience, and then you know what sometimes happens? We have this experience of faith, and our life changes, and we start eating differently and dressing differently, and our entertainment changes, and we change all these different things, and then we look around and we're like, whew, God, I thank you that I'm not like those people. Man, they're so corrupt. They don't believe in present truth. God, I thank you that my presence blesses this church with present truth. And that's why the next parable is given by Jesus. Let's look at it. Now, what I just said is not to negate the fact that we absolutely should be crying day and night unto the Lord. But it's not for the purpose of becoming proud of ourselves. Starting in verse 9, and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So verse 9 is exactly what I just said. Boy, if you think you're righteous and you despise other people, you better watch out. Verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. So the Pharisee is the church leader. The publican is the guy that comes off the street. Or he's the tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you. Who oh, I thank you. That I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So notice, that publican says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. You know what happened to him? He was avenged speedily. He went down to his house justified. But the other guy sure didn't. Listen, if you're coming to the Lord saying, Lord, please deliver me so that I can be the best, most righteous, sanctified Adventist in Adventism, you're praying the wrong prayer. God, I thank you that my exemplary life of health reform and dress reform and entertainment reform and the way I preach and all of those things, wow, thank you that I'm not like those other people in the church who don't eat like me and dress my, like me and talk like me and all of those things. Now, mind you, I am not here to condemn dress reform and health reform. You get the point. And it's interesting, this prayer can be prayed by the different classes in the church, and I kind of hate to use these terms, but for the lack of a better term so you understand what I'm talking about, you know, the conservatives are like, God, I thank you that we don't eat what they eat and wear what they wear and watch what they watch. Thank you that we're following the plan. Thank you we're not like that. But then the liberals can be like, God, I thank you that we're not judgmental and legalistic like those people. And in either case, you're proud and you're not justified. Here's the interesting thing. <clears throat> the first parable describes how to develop faith. We develop faith through an act of prayer life where we plead unto the Lord, according to his word, the promises of God. 
where God says, yes, I am able to keep you from falling. God says, yes, I will forgive your sins. God says, yes, I can help you to be forgiving. God says, I will give you everything that you need according to my will. And when we learn by experience to cry day and night unto the Lord, we develop an experience of faith where we know who we believe. That's the experience of faith through an active living prayer life. The next parable talks about what justification is like. Justification is humbling ourselves before God. And so we don't go around, now look, our lives change, our tastes change, we become different people. But we then don't go around saying, God, I thank you that we're so much better than everyone else, because we realize how weak and sinful we really are, and our faith hangs on to God because we only we know that it's only by his power that we can be saved. And then justification is the next parable where we humble ourselves before God because we know we don't deserve one ounce of salvation. It's only by the goodness of Jesus, by his grace, that we're saved. And so these two parables put together describe justification by faith, which is the third angel's message. Review and Herald, April 1, 1890, several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message, and I have answered it is the third angel's message in verity. And then it goes on to say, the prophet declares, and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. That's Revelation 18.1. Brightness, glory, and power are to be connected with the third angel's message, and conviction will follow wherever it is preached in demonstration of the Spirit. Now, justification by faith, Ellen White also says in Testimonies to the Ministers, page 456, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. And I just want to say this. You know, there's a tendency in Adventism to follow superstar preachers, Hey, have you heard so-and-so? Man, they give the best bread you'll have ever eaten. They give it straight. They're calling it like it is. You should be following them. You know what? Last time I checked, we should be following Jesus. And some of these guys start to get kind of prideful because we say so many things to them about how great they are. And it's only because of God that anybody is good. And here's the point. God is not looking or more superstar preachers in Adventism that call it straight. God is looking for people who are humbled, where the glory of man is laid in the dust so that we're justified and where we're crying day and night unto the Lord saying, Lord, humble me, do whatever it takes to humble my pride because pride is the most offensive sin to God. Forgive me for thinking that I'm better than other people. I'm a weak, sinful human being who needs the grace of God. And so we humble ourselves before the Lord, and the glory of man is laid in the dust so that we can be justified, and we experience faith as we claim God's promises. And when we have this experience, then, as the quote from Review and Herald says, then the latter rain is going to be poured out where an angel comes down from heaven, having great power, and the earth is lightened with his glory, because God will not pour out the Holy Spirit on a bunch of proud Seventh-day Adventists who think they're the best thing that's ever happened to the church. Man, my ministry is better than your ministry because we follow the clear plan of soul winning, and you guys miss on that. So we're better than you. And then we wonder why the latter rain hasn't been poured out. The latter rain is going to be poured out when God has people who are humble, who think others better than themselves, rather than thinking we're the ones that have it all figured out. We realize that that anything we bring to the table is only by the grace of God because we are weak and sinful. So as I wrap this message up, you know, when Jesus comes, what is he going to find? What does he see in you today? Does he see a sinner saved by grace who has humbled yourself before the throne of grace, saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. But I want to be changed. I want to be humble, but I want to be your representative. And I need to be delivered from pride, from selfishness, from envy, from backbiting, from all of these different things. And I need faith. 
avenge me of mine adversary. Give me the faith that I need. Because right now what Jesus sees, he sees a church that thinks that it's rich. It thinks that it has faith. It thinks that it's on its way to heaven. Thinks that it's so good. And yet Jesus is now you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And God is looking for people who are saying, avenge me of mine adversary, Lord. Avenge me of being lukewarm. Avenge me of thinking that I'm better than everyone else. Give me the faith the faith of Jesus to believe that you really can change me completely. Humble me and give me the experience that is needed to be ready for the coming of the Lord. When Jesus comes, what is he going to find in you? Maybe you don't have that faith that you need right now. But it's not too late to get it. And if you are lacking in that, I would just encourage you. I'm not going to make an altar call wherever people come forward, but I'm making an appeal to you in your heart as you sit where you are in the pew. You know, we can all come in here looking really good. But you know in your heart if you are justified by faith. You know if you have really surrendered your life to the Lord, and if you are crying day and night to the Lord. If you if you don't have a prayer life, if you're not crying day and night to the Lord, today is the day to start. It's still early in the year. It can be a New Year's resolution 21 days late. I'm going to cry day and night to the Lord until he changes my heart completely. I'm going to exercise faith in the promises of God as I pray to him, and I'm going to ask that he humble me and help me to realize that I'm not better than anybody else. Every single one of us here is saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, and not one of us is better than anybody else. We are equal at the foot of the cross. And so as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness, I just want to challenge you as we are coming into this new year to tap into the great faithfulness of God and allow him through his power to avenge you of your adversary, the devil, who has caused you to be proud and who has caused you to go against the law of God so that you're not really justified by faith, even though you've been proud of yourself for being a good outwardly looking Seventh-day Adventist, but on the inside, Jesus has not been the Lord of your life. Now is the time to let Jesus come in and to cry day and night unto him. And you know what the promise is? He will avenge you speedily. There are some of you who came in here today with that burden, and you can walk out of here avenged speedily, knowing that Jesus has heard your prayer, because he is faithful. Amen.